And so welcome to the second session of the aquatic species. Mm -hmm. And up first we have Richard Valdez from SWCA Environmental Consultants. And today he will be presenting use of middle Rio Grande floodplains by the endangered Rio Grande silvery minnow. Thank you, Mo. That was a kind introduction. Yes, I mean, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Appreciate that. Okay, we're going to switch from uh, poetry of the Rio Grande to poetry of the Silvery, silvery Minnow. <clears throat> the Middle Rio Grande Collaborative Program has been engaged in habitat restoration for many years. The 2003 biological opinion probably is what stimulated or instigated that to begin with, where it required restoration and creation of floodplain habitat as a way to reconnect the river to its, to its floodplain as much as possible. <clears throat> the work I'm gonna talk about is work that has been done through the, by SWCA through the Interstate Stream Commission with support from other individuals as well. And I'll show you those acknowledgements here in a bit. I wanna especially thank my co-author, Grace Haggerty, who's been instrumental in development of these uh, floodplain habitats for many years not only in the restoration, but also in the continued evaluation of those as well. So the 2016 biological opinion contains something called the hydrobiological objective. And that HBO has two strategies for recovery of the Rio Grande Silvery Mill, the production strategy and the survival strategy. I'm going to talk primarily about the production strategy. It is the time of year in the springtime when flows are high and when the fish generally spawn. And it talks toward reproduction of the fish and the survival of those individuals. The survival strategy is what takes place in the summertime when the river is intermittent or low. And I won't address that in this presentation. <clears throat> On the right is a figure that's taken from Appendix A of the 2016 BO. I submit that this positive relationship between high spring flow and Rio Grande Supermental density is related to floodplain inundation and survival of larvae. And I also submit that this is the key to recovering this population. What happens in the springtime with these fish is sets the stage for the cohort for the year in the strength of that year class. Let's start first of all by looking at fish species composition. What fish usually actually use these floodplains? On the left are two pie charts that show the here and here that show the catch in these floodplains for 2016, 2017 with bipeds. So these are larger body fish. On the right are our catches for 2016, 2017. That we caught with dip nets. So these are the early life stages of the species. Note a couple of things. The more abundant species in the system, and this is not just the 2016 and 17, but other years as well. The more abundant species are usually red shiners, uh, common carp, river carp suckers, but silvery minnow, when the abundance is moderate to high, are usually very common and abundant in floodplains. On the right, silvery minnow dominate the larval fish composition in these floodplains. Now that's for a couple of reasons. Number one, silvery minnow is usually one of the earliest spawners in the middle of Rio Grande. So they're going to be present before other larvae are. But they're also quite common in there because spawning is associated with these floodplains. And I'm gonna talk about that some more here in a bit. <coughs> With respect to the adult population of the adult silvery minnow that we find in floodplains, and these are again fish that are caught in these uh, group nets. The work that SWCA goes back to, the work done by Eric Gonzalez, 2008, and then the work that we've done most recently, 2016, 17, and then also the work that we did this year that Steve Zipper was involved in. Now, these three columns represent the different conditions for adult silvery minnow. 
as draft females, nuptial males, and spent females. The colors across correspond with the colors for these different studies. So across, Eric Gonzalez of the fish that he found, 40% of the silvery male were gravid females, 27% nuptial males, 12% spent females. The point here is that spawning is associated with floodplains. It's not clear yet whether they spawn exclusively in the floodplains or not. We believe at this point in time, there's probably spawning in along main stem bank lines as well as in floodplains. And let me show you some more evidence as to why we think that. Here is a list of the fish that are caught, or that were caught at least, in the main stem. This is the population monitoring work done by, done by uh, Rob Dudley and others using sayings, 2016-17. This is for the month of June only. So these two data sets correspond. This is the fight net catches that we did in June for those two years as well. So you look at the list of species, and here's the 20 species here that we, that we saw. All together, I think, Rob, you've caught something like 38 species is what I counted from, from your work. So you've caught more species than this, but this is just for these two years. Notice again, the, common, the more common species of these that you see about the top nine or 10, uh, silvery metal, of course, red shiner, long nose days, fatted chuck, channel catfish, common carp, at it, uh, male river carp suckers, white suckers, and western mosquito fish. These are the ones that you see most commonly in the system. But here's the interesting thing. Of those 20 species that we caught, in, in those two years, we found 13 of these, and this is the check marks, that were actually found as either larvae or young fish in the floodplains. So clearly, in this river system, as is true in many river systems, the fish are using the floodplains as nurseries, or at least many of the species are. Now that doesn't mean that they're in there exclusively. That means that they use those as nurseries. <coughs> so in 2016, we took the length of the silvery metal larvae that we caught in floodplains, and we used a temperature dependent model that Rob W. and Steve Quintana have developed as a way to estimate the hatching dates of the fish. And that's what these two histograms are here. The top one is for 2016. So these are the estimated hatching dates for the sample of fish that we took. And it was about 1,700 or so fish all together. Note that the hatching started sometime in about mid-April and extended to the end of May and the 1st of June. It's, it's pretty consistent, I think, with what Rob reported yesterday for his egg study. Now, these other lines, the curved or the irregular blue line, <clears throat> is discharge of the Rio Grande at Albuquerque. And the smooth line is the cumulative temperature degree days. That is the daily temperature at the Alameda Bridge added to the previous day. So it accumulates over time. And I did that for a particular reason. I'll show you why here in a bit. <clears throat> this is for 2017. Notice for 2016, it was a fairly normal looking distribution of hatching dates. For 2017, it was more irregular. We think part of the reason is again, similar to what Rod Dudley reported yesterday, evidently when there is a sudden increase in flow, we have some spawning taking place and some hatching. And then we saw the majority of that with that larger and major increase here later on. Now, the interesting thing about this, so, so we are trying to figure out why it is that the fish spawn when they do and, and what cues them or keys them to spawn relative to flow and temperature. The temperature at the initiation of spawning in the two years was different, the actual river temperature. About 12 and a half degrees since 2016, about 10 degrees in 2017. However, for that same day, the cumulative degree days, that's the cumulative temperature above five degrees centigrade, was almost identical, 692 versus 694. This is pretty similar to what's been reported for other silvery minnow-like species from other river systems. So we're starting to develop the hypothesis here that perhaps we can look at cumulative degree days of temperature as some early predictor, perhaps, of spawning for the silvery minnow. 
I'm going to use four illustrations by Howard Brandenburg to point out one other thing about silvery minnow in these floodplains. Silvery minnow go through four life phases, protolarvae, mesolarvae, flexion, which is, if you look at the notochord on this guy, notice it's straight. Notice how it's flexed right there. That's why they're called flexion. This is when the notochord flexes upward. You can see it in most guys. Another thing about this too is that this is when they first start developing fin rays. They develop most of the fin rays by that late mesolarval stage, and by the metalarval stage, they've got fully developed fin rays. We believe that what is happening is that these fish have increased swimming ability. You recall yesterday, Douglas Tate talked about schooling of fish that were 10 millimeters long in this size right here. And, and we think that part of the reason that these fish leave the floodplain is they get to the point of where they're capable swimmers, they start schooling, they start searching for food, escaping predators, and moving around a lot more, and they move out of these floodplains. And you can see this here. This is a continuous time series for the proportion of these different phases of silvery minnow in restored floodplains, this is 2017, and main stem bank lines. We also sampled the main stem simultaneously. A couple of things to point out. Notice these proportions of the different stages are very similar, although they're greater in the bank lines. But notice one thing. We, we rarely catch very many juveniles in floodplains, juvenile silver minnow, even though the floodplain is still inundated. Most of those juveniles show up in the main stem, indicating there is a evidently voluntary movement away or out of those floodplains at that time. So what happens if you've got fish that are, so, so basically, if you look at the age of these fish, these fish are about 14 days of age to 22. Our hypothesis right now is that these fish leave the floodplain at a if you look at the distribution for 2016 and cast a shadow of that 14 days in advance, 22 days in advance here, you will see that the majority of that spawning took place prior to floodplain inundation at 1500 CFS. And in fact, only about a third of the hatch occurred during the time that the flows were above 1500 CFS indicating that there's probably main stem spawning along bank lines, the fish move into those, or they're transported into those, or there's movement. We think now that this is evidence that there's evidently some kind of flux in, in the larvae and eggs between the main stem and floodplains to where you see this movement back and forth. So in conclusion then, we agree with Medley and Shirey that this is primarily a demersal floodplain spawner. But we add some information to that. The long distance transport of propagules and upstream return of young is probably an, art, an artifact of contemporary, contemporary flow management and channelization that has led to reduced lateral connectivity and delinking of the floodplain. The fish are doing what they're doing because it's a different river than it used to be. Mechanism behind that the HBO is a retention of larvae in sheltered low velocity habitats. And we think this is critical to the life history of the species, to the, to the annual success and the reproduction and recruitment of the fish. And this is what sets the stage for that October census that, it, that is taken every year. I want to thank all of these individuals uh, for all of the assistance and collaboration that we've received from everybody. And I'll be willing to take maybe one question. Deb? Yes. Hi. Just would you clarify for me? So it looks like the fish are spawning on the ascending limb before the peak and before the floodplain is fully inundated. So if they're spawning along the bank line, they're spawning near the bank line. 
in the main stem are the physics of the water and transport of those early larvae that can't swim yet. Are, are they getting pushed onto the floodplain as the water comes up? Yeah, thank you. Um, probably in that protolarval and early mesolarval stage, the movement of those fish is passive. In other words, they're caught up by the currents and they're moved. They have some, they, they have what's known as a sea movement, which is they just basically curl up in a little curl and then just flex, open up. And that's about the only movement they have. Once they develop fin rays, once they've got rigidity in those fins, it's like, it's like trying to paddle with a jello, with a, I'm sorry, trying to paddle with a paddle made of paper or jello. There's no rigidity in that. Once they have that rigidity, they're able to swim around. And so I, like I described below before, I think it's a flux of movement that takes place depending on when the spawning takes place relative to inundation. And of course, that's the management implication, right? If we can estimate when that spawning might take place, we might be able to determine, based on Rob's findings as well, when that spawning can actually occur. If they're ready to spawn at a certain temperature degree day level, then perhaps we can actually stimulate the spawning by flow management. Yeah, is there another one? Hi, thanks, sir. Hi, Paul. Hi. So what are you guys calling floodplains when you include the vegetative bars and islands? And if so, do you see any sort of difference between those and the floodplain? Yeah, we're, the flood, we, we went to specific, fairly identifiable floodplains, especially these restored sites. But the floodplain is really everything that you see, like in 2005, you know, you had a lot of water up in the vegetation, right? And those fish are using probably most of that habitat that's available. Yes. Thank you.